you. Welcome. Well, thanks for this uh, wonderful introduction. Um, the beginning of the program already uh, changed my whole life. I just changed my words in the break from uh, digital to analog because I was uh, actually afraid of losing uh, reading and words. So that was a big change. I also uh, re-started uh, uh, my TikTok account. I only use it to follow my children, but now I uh, have to actively use it. Um, but now we're actually going to change gears a bit uh, because I'm a scientist. Meaning that I actually base everything I say on data. So I'm not going to uh, predict your future. I'm not going to tell you what you have to do. I'm just going to show you what the data told us. And hopefully you will use that to change your own mind and maybe in the end your own happiness. Um, what is surprising to me when I listen to all the slogans, also from the Dutch companies, but also many slogans at my own table, is that we live in a world where we think that we can create everything. That everything can change, that we can change people, that we can change health, that we can change beliefs, that we can change the future. And I think that the uh, recent pandemic, hopefully uh, past pandemic, but you never know, uh, did show us uh, that there's a lot that's uncontrollable. So I'm going to show you a bit about uh, the happiness and also about uh, genes. And as you might know, even if you only had a couple of lessons in biology, genes are fixed. So talking about change should also always be by the idea that we are driven by our genes that are fixed. But first, the question I, I was asked is to explain a bit what is happiness? Well, that is a simple question, there's only three words, and I could spend like hours on what is happiness. So I just want to show you a couple of historical things and uh, data, uh, but happiness is actually what you feel. So I can only tell you what my happiness looks like, and you also saw it in the screen, that what makes you happy is different for everybody. But to get back to the uh, old philosophers, uh, we have definitions for happiness. And we actually define currently in research, but also in daily life, happiness in actually two branches. So we have the uh, hedonic happiness, and the economists tend to call that subjective well-being, a term I actually hate because they, that's the only term that has subjective in it. So if we use it in research, they say it's subjective well-being, we never say subjective depression or subjective um, psychosis or subjective neuroticism. So it's actually a strange development and when you talk about happiness that it's suddenly subjective. It is completely subjective, but it doesn't need the extra term. When we study well-being or hedonic well-being, we use measures that actually focus on happiness, satisfaction with life, quality of life. Well, this has been studied most, but recently the focus shifted a bit and we shifted to the ideas of Aristotle, although if we talk about happiness, if you Google happiness and philosophy, you always come to Aristotle, but he's actually not talking about happiness, but he's talking out about psychological well-being. So more about meaning in life, purpose and flourishing. Well, most importantly, these things are strongly related. So if you say, I like to drive on happiness, you can also drive on purpose. It's not really a different thing, although some companies think, well, I redevelop myself and focus on purpose, you still do the same thing. People that score high on happiness generally also score high on purpose and meaning in life, for example. How to measure happiness? Uh, given that we need data, uh, and I hope that a part of what you do is also based on data, uh, because uh, if we lose the data in the world, I think we can't make a strong case of what's really happening. Uh, and actually, it's really easy. Michiel also already mentioned the World Happiness Report, and the World Happiness Report uses this particular question. They use it all around the world, and the question is simple. If you would consider your life, what would you, how would you rate it? Zero meaning the worst life you can imagine, and ten the best life you can imagine. Well, that's, it's of course not cultural free, but it's easy, so you can use it all around the world. And I will later say what the problems with this measure is, but this is actually as reliable 
as using a 50 pages questionnaire. So if you're interested in measuring happiness in groups of people, you can just use this question. Ideally use it multiple times, multiple times a day for example, since if you talk about yourself you know it's not that stable. It's also not that it's unreliable due to its fluctuations because we all have a general level of happiness. Well, during my talk, but in general, if you uh, want to dive into the literature, uh, it's a big mess, like scientific literature is in general, but I think the field of well-being is famous for creating a mess while it's still a young field of research because we use all these different terminologies like uh, in the same paper, meaning the same thing. And so we often call it well-being and that means happiness or life satisfaction or quality of life and even the eudaimonic well-being, things like meaning and purpose. Well, what is happiness? This is one of my favorite studies. Uh, I didn't do the study, but it's still my favorite study. And the task was easy. They asked individuals, they gave them a, just a white paper with a blue puppet on it, and they said, okay, I'm going to ask you about emotions. Where do you feel the following emotions? And they had to use a, a red color when it felt warm and, a, 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 and, and yellow, and when it felt cold, it was blue reddish. Well, to give you an example, uh, if you're angry, where do you feel when you feel angry? Anyone? Stomach, head, fists. This is what came out. So the most yellow part is the, the places of the body where people feel the most emotion related to angry. So you feel it indeed in your arms, in your head, in your chest. You are angry and a bit in your feet. That's because you can stamp your feet when you're angry. Pride. That's an easy one. You feel it in the upper part of your body. Indeed, this is how you feel pride. Your legs are totally out of the emotion. It's only in the upper part of your body. Of course, then the crucial question to you. We talk about happiness. Where in the body do you feel happiness? Louder? All over. Well, you're the easiest class I've ever seen. <laughs> University students uh, never do that. Indeed, happiness is the only human emotion. I just show you three, but they're like, they tested 20. It's the only one that you feel in the whole body. To me, this is evidence that it's a very important emotion. It's very important to talk about happiness, to know how happy you are, and to know how to help others to be happy. And why is it important? Of course, not only for your own feeling of happiness, but research has shown very strongly that happy people are healthier, they live longer, they function better, and they have stronger social relationships. Well, if you have, would be the leader of any country in the world, I think this should be the list of what you want for your people. Importantly, I don't assume any direction of causality here. So maybe happy people are healthier, but you can also be happier because you're healthy, of course. Well, well-being is on the top priority of all these governmental organizations, and I hope that's inspirational to you uh, to also put well-being at the top priority of your own business. Uh, and we're getting better around the world because recently we established the economy of well-being with the whole idea that we should get rid of like the whole economic system based on GDPs, but that we should think about the well-being of people and planet. Well, that's nothing new, but if you want something to change, you also have to act. And uh, New Zealand is, for example, a very strong partner of this uh, economy alliance because they actually have a large part of their financial system to drive this well-being. Instead of what is the financial situation of the country, they measure what's the well-being of the people that live in our country. But... Just to warn you, the evidence that's known for well-being is mostly based on a model like this. 
Actually, most of the research is based on a model like this. We always tend to compare different groups of people. Another warning is that in the field of well-being, but also in our own minds, well-being always comes last. If I tick all the boxes, I will be happy. If I reach this, I will be happy. If I make my target, I feel well, I will be happy. One very famous example is about money. Someone said, someone gave the social unacceptable answer that money makes you happy. That is the case. There has been this story of economists saying that we have a certain level of money that we need, and then there's an upper amount. That could be the case if we ignore that we are all different. Because the amount of money that I need to be happy is different than the amount of money that you need, for example. But money uh, is always one of the, uh, the, the examples saying, well, money makes happiness. You need money to become happy. Well, one of my other favorite studies is this one. It's from, the, uh, from England. Uh, and what you see in this diagram is very fascinating to me as well. So what did they do? They had a group of 16-year-olds. And they ask these 16-year-olds to rate their well-being. They call it positive effect here. Like I said, it's a mess in the field, but it's simply happiness. Then they actually ask these same people two years later when they were 18, and four years later when they were 22. The blue bars represent the level of happiness, with the lightest color being the most happiest, happiest people of the group. Then when these people became 29, they ask them about their income. And what you clearly see, can you see this? No, you can't see it. Is that the light bars, the most happy people when they were young, earn significant more than the ones that were less happy. So it's not that money makes happiness, it's that happiness makes money. So in this case, but in many cases, happiness comes first. And the good message is, is that happiness can, is trainable. So actually, you should start by making yourself happy, your family happy, and everybody around you happy. And then money, in that sense, follows, and a lot follows. And for companies, uh, I would really uh, point you to the work of Kim Cameron, if you don't know him. He's one of my colleagues in the International Positive Psychology Association, and he's actually famous for showing companies what well-being is doing to the company. Not talking about the money you can make, talking about what happens when you make your people happy. About the group comparisons. The most famous comparison we do every year in the World Happiness Report is this one. It's comparing the different countries. This one is from the report of 2021. Uh, there's not much of a change in 2022. Uh, and as you can see, it's uh, always the Scandinavian countries that jump out. They're in the top five. The Netherlands, tiny, doesn't ha even have a number on this slide. But we are almost always also in the top five or, or at the sixth or seventh spot. If you look at this map, it doesn't probably surprise you that it's a, it's a reflection of what we know what's happening in the world. And it's 2021, so there's a lot of things happened after that that might change the map. But for example, the COVID pandemic had only a tiny effect on happiness levels around the world. Well, although it is the World Happiness Report, uh, um, I don't think this is a right and fair comparison. I don't think this is useful. Because if I go back to my own country, we on average score a 7.6 really high on a scale from 0 to 10. But this is the reality of our country. So not everybody scores a 7.6. So the number 7.6 is useless, because I can come up with a 7.6 with any range of numbers in the end. It doesn't tell me anything about my country or the group of people you're interested in. So always ask about diversity. Always ask about the variance. Because if we say the Netherlands scores a 7.6, we can actually stop doing anything. Well, you can see that some people score a 3, a 2, a 1, so there's a lot to do to make people happier in our country. 
differences. I think that's my main message, that we should focus on the differences between people instead of the commonalities between people. <coughs> and where do differences between people come from? I actually spoiled my own question in the beginning, so anyone? Genes. Every difference between humans is because of the interplay of your genetic predisposition and your environmental exposure. Anything we can measure in a human being, and we did that over 50 years now with twin and family studies and genetic studies, has a genetic component. There's nothing in what you do, in what you believe, or how you act that's not partly driven by your genotype. There's also almost nothing except for certain illnesses that has no environmental influence. So it's always the gene and the environment. So there's never a debate, there's never a discussion, it's always genes and environment, and also for happiness. So some people are happier than other people due to genetic differences. How strong are these effects? Well, if we specifically look at happiness, 40% of the differences in happiness between you is because you have genetic differences. 60% of the differences in happiness between you is due to the fact that you live and act in different environments. So both are very important. One can be changed, the other one is fixed. To give you a bit more evidence that we know a bit more than only the heritability, as we call it, we even have shown that happiness is in your genes. And we had two designs, and this is a very elegant one. We had uh, 10K people. Uh, we had their genomes. It's very easy to stick a, a, a cheek swap, for example. It takes one minute, send it to the lab, you have your whole genome. And we asked them about their level of well-being. Simple question is, do people have more similar DNA if they have more similar scores for well-being? And yes, that was the case. So that's evidence based really on genetic material from, a, from human beings that happiness is in your genes. Then the most uh, ugly slide, for you probably, not for me, because this is the most scientific slide of all, is about where are these genes for happiness? Because if we know where they are, we might fix them. Well, to show you that that will be impossible, that you will never have to be afraid of a happiness pill, is shown in this picture. What you see on the horizontal axis is the 22 human chromosomes. You don't have to know anything about it, but you have 22 chromosomes and you have your sex chromosomes. On the vertical axis is the outcome of a statistical test. Not very relevant. We had over 2 million people in the study, and for these people we had, uh, for every individual, over 2 million genetic variants. Every dot is a genetic variant, and the ones that jump out over the line, that have a little orange triangle, are the ones that are significantly related to well-being. So nowadays we know about over 300 locations all over the human genome that explain differences in well-being. This is helpful for us, but it also protects us from any like strange ideas about changing genes. That will be impossible, and we also show that genes are important, but that you can't change the genotype. Well, so genes are there. We have shown that they are related to well-being. How about the environment? In the past, people, and maybe because you're not, you don't have a genetic background, you might think, well, whew, glad, the genetics is over, we're now going to the environment. We can fix it, it's easy. Well, I can tell you the environment is way more difficult. The environment is way more complex than our genome. Our genome is easy, we know all about it, we know the whole structure, we know for everybody what their genome is. We don't know nothing about environments. We can't measure environments at such a large scale as we can measure uh, the genome. But we tried. So what did we do? We had 7,000 people with satisfaction of life data, and based on their residential postal codes, we added all kinds of environmental variables. We did that because we want to have a systematic approach. 
and not only approach where you take one environmental factor and look if it's related to well-being. We had all kinds of environmental uh, factors and we categorized them in physical environments, so air pollution, green space, all that kind of stuff. Culture, how many cinemas, theaters are there in your environment? The socioeconomic status of the environment. Accessibility, is it easily accessible? Can you easily move around? Uh, level of education and education possibilities in the environment. Livability, very important one, that's partly objective by the number of crimes and partly subjective about the social cohesion, uh, and the care facilities and sports facilities. Well, previous studies showed, for example, that air pollution was an important factor, green space was an important factor, and sports is an important factor. But if you put them all in a mix, the picture changes. And this is similar to the genetic picture. You have all the environmental factors on the horizontal axis, and only the ones that jump out above the red line do matter for well-being. So no air pollution, no sports facilities, uh, no care facilities, no culture, only mainly socioeconomic status factors. That's very important for policy making. Socioeconomic status is still one of the main drivers for well-being. If you correct for all socioeconomic status factors, only one thing is left, and that is safety. In this case, it's of course safety of the neighborhood because it's based on residential postal codes. But the idea of safety being very important for well-being is actually important for every circumstance. So safety is the one that's left if you correct for all other factors, also for socioeconomic status. So also in your companies, uh, of course it's already like the buzzword, but safety is very important for the well-being of your people. Finally, the uh, technology was one of the main questions. What's the link of technology and well-being? Simple. The results are mixed. Causality is unknown. And the only uh, thing that we did so far is try a one-size-fits-all approach. So actually, we don't know what the relation between well-being and technology is because we didn't use the right methods and we didn't use the right designs. To give you an example, uh, this is actually uh, about teenagers, uh, but they are human beings, so it's not different for adults or young children. And what they show here is the effect of uh, passive social media use on, on uh, the individuals, uh, and in this case on envy, inspiration, and enjoyment. And there has been this strong theory that social media use and passive social media use has an overall negative effect. Well, you don't have to understand the full picture. I can only say that the green people are the ones with a positive effect. The gray ones have no effect and the red ones have a negative effect. Representing the effect that the same thing has totally different effect on different people. So you can't say social media is good or social media is bad. It depends on the human being and it depends largely on the genotype of an individual. How sensitive are you? to the comparison to peer groups, for example. How sensitive are you for everything that's sold on the internet? That's all in your genes. Then the beauty of technology, I think that's important also to mention. I think technology will bring us a lot of information. It will bring us a lot of data. And in current societies, I think data should still be the main driver of our decisions. To give you an example of the uh, applications of um, technology in well-being research, this is uh, life satisfaction measured on the left side by the standard questionnaires. Red meaning having low life satisfaction and green meaning having high life satisfaction. The right one is based on Twitter data. And as you can see, it's almost a perfect representation. So you don't have to bother people with a survey you just have to download all Twitter data, which are public. So it gives you a lot of information, and, and the group of people who studied this studied the whole American elections, for example, and we're now collaborating with them to do the same thing in the Netherlands. This is an example of uh, something we have been working on based on, this is Facebook data, a bit different because you have to get permission to obtain the data from the individual, but that's still easier than sending them a 50 pages questionnaire. You have low mood and self-worth, for example, 
captured in a word cloud per individual. So you can actually quantify based on the words people use how they feel. Another example, an obvious example uh, of use of data, uh, what most of us are actually also doing because we all watch, uh, wear smartwatches nowadays, is that you can use phones to assess the well-being of individuals and more importantly to assess the environment. So what we currently are doing is uh, measuring well-being with this one question, eight times a day, same individual, two weeks. But we also assess light, uh, number of Wi-Fi accounts in the neighborhood, uh, explaining how... Uh, uh, Busy it is, the weather, the noise, Bluetooth, everything you can assess with a phone is captured and then we can create the environment and have a well-being score. And we call this, this real-time well-being instead of questionnaire well-being. Then a new study that we will be doing uh, is actually in line with uh, the gamification that has been mentioned. Uh, I think gamification is uh, one of the future directions. Um, you can train well-being. I can talk for hours about training well-being. It's, it's relatively easy, so anyone who's interested uh, can find me later. Um, but you have to sell the fact that you can train it, and how can you do that? And one of the uh, applications is developed by uh, an SME in the Netherlands called Green Habit, and we're going, actually going to study this design because trainability has a genetic component. So we're going to use this gamified well-being training in a twin sample, enabling us to study the genes and environment on the effects of the training. And then in the end, which part of the training works for whom? Because you can develop a whole training and only 10% is working for person one and other 10% is working for person two, due to the genetic differences. Finally, I think uh, life is nice because we have challenges, otherwise it would become boring. Uh, what challenges are we encountering in the field of well-being? Um, first of all, it's very complex. So if you go back home tomorrow and say, well, we're going to change the well-being of the company, I think that's a bit ambitious. It's a good plan to start, but it's very complex because it means something different for everybody. So it starts by listening to people, asking people what their well-being is and how you can actually improve their well-being. Well-being is highly polygenic, meaning that there are many genes involved in well-being. So some people are happy easily almost every day. Some people are at the total opposite, and it takes a lot of energy to be happy. And most of us are in between and are sometimes happy and sometimes not. You can't judge someone else's happiness, and you can't easily change someone else's happiness. So it's also something you have to live with. But being in the genes doesn't mean you can't change it. For example, if you, th if you think about exercise behavior, some people are brilliant exercisers. I was sitting at lunch next to someone. There he is. He ran the marathon of Amsterdam. Uh, has been high on my list, but uh, impossible. Um, and the slogan of runners is always, you can, everybody can run a marathon. Which is, from a physiological perspective, nonsense. A lot of people cannot run a marathon, will never be able to run a marathon. But everybody can improve his or her health by training. And some people can improve easily, and some people can only improve a bit. Same for happiness, you can train happiness, some can simply increase their happiness, others have to train every day only to add a tiny bit of happiness to their life. Environmental influence is very important. 60% of the differences in happiness is driven by environmental influences, but way more complex. So don't expect that if you change one thing in the environment, for example, people are changing office space due to the homeworking situation and say, well, we create this nice brain uh, tank area or discussion area. It's not changing the well-being of people easily. Some people might like it, other people not. So again, start by listening to your people because they are all different. And there's an interplay, but I will not bother you with that today. But uh, it's very important, you always have your genotype and importantly, your genotype is one of your drivers. So it determines a lot of what you do. The fact that you are here is partly driven by your genotype. Then this is a very old picture, but I think it's still very important if you think about working with people, interacting with people, 
always realize that everybody is different. There is not a one-size-all solution, even not if you do it in a digital world. And then, um, as a final slide, this is from uh, Monty Python, Life of Brian. Please realize with everything that you do that we are all different. Thank you. So, Maaike, thank you very much for your presentation. While I was listening, I started to be very curious about how happy this audience is. Now, we happen to have a Busmaster tool, so if you take up your phone and just ask the question, very simple, how would you rate your life in general between zero and 10? So here we go. Seven, oh, okay, look, it's, it's moving 7.5, 7.6. Seven point nine, seven point seven. So, so maybe we can make them a little bit more unhappy. Um, so, the people that are close to the five, I see, and I see one at zero. After this session, if you go out here on the left, there is a therapy session, especially for you. Um, no, no, no. The, this is the picture. Uh, there's, yeah, still my, my crying, yeah. This is a picture that you often see by a voluntary audience being somewhere to get inspired. This is not a reflection, of course. You are not a reflection of society, uh, but you still see, see that there are individual differences. Uh, and the zero doesn't help because uh, anyone with a bit of analytical skills knows that this zero uh, drops the uh, average. Uh, uh, to a larger extent than all the other numbers. There's a 10 as well. Eh? So that helps, uh, yeah, but then you're helps. at the 5, so you still have to climb to the 7.9. Uh, um, so, so another question. Uh, so you talked about genetics and happiness. So if I understand it, people are, have a predisposition for happiness. For some people, it's easier yeah. to have a happy life than for other people. Is it also for countries that, that Swedes or Finnish people are easier more happy than Dutch or, well, uh, uh, I, I saw also the score for Botswana, for uh, what is it, for uh, uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, but but is, is there a national genetics part of that? Uh, not really. Uh, and the answer is actually we don't know. Uh, because most of the genetic studies is like most of the research by itself is done on European ancestry populations due to the availability of data. Uh, so we know everything about the genes for happiness on European ancestry populations, and that's now expanded to uh, African populations, Asian populations, but they have a different genotype. Uh, but uh, Scandinavia, well, Finland has a bit of a different genotype than uh, the, the other countries in I've uh, Europe. I've noticed when I visited them, uh, <laughs> ah. because they are the happiest country in the world, but they're also the best at hiding it, I think. Uh, true, yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But they have to, well, Finnish not, but Swedish, people from Sweden and from Norway, for example, that are always high in the list, have the exact same genotype as we have in the Netherlands or people in France or... That's uh, fascinating. So you have here people that make decisions around technology and the design of technology. How, how, um, uh, how, how convinced are you that happiness actually plays a role in the design of technology? Is it enough or do we just focus on efficiency? And, uh... I think it's, it's very important and I think I work at an institution that provided the best example. I don't know if anybody followed the big disaster at our university. They implemented a total new system for all the, like, the, the regular processes in the, in the, in the, at the university. But they bought a system that has been developed for a bank. Makes sense, right? Yeah. Makes, to that, the ones who bought it, it made sense. It's, really, it, it's already a mess for two years. People don't get salary, people can't get a contract, people get fired instantly, and all the main processes that we normally do are unavailable. There has been an external report showing that this was the biggest mistake, but it has a very big influence on the daily happiness of people that work with the system. If I have to do something in the system, and I have because I'm funded from the EU and I have to write hours, it really, my happiness drops. And I have to do it only like once a week, but like our, our uh, supporting staff is constantly in the system that's just not functioning at all. So, you're, so you're, the sick leave 
in our university increased with 5%. So you are explaining to us that we know how to do it wrong, to exactly. make, create unhappiness? Ask the people. Yeah. Don't develop a system without asking the people that use it. And they are all different. So that's why it's very scary to do so. Because they will all give a different answer. And then don't do the Dutch thing. Don't do the pollering. But start talking to them how you can actually create a system that makes the majority of the people happy. You will never be able to serve everybody. Now, last question for you. And I'm sure that it's on the mind of everyone here. So I have this quote. I don't know from who it was that it is. Basically, if you have to be unhappy, anyhow, it's better to be unhappy in a Rolls Royce than waiting for the bus at the bus stand. <laughs> um, so just a simple answer. Does money make you happy? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> now, a very simple answer. Some, uh, and, uh, genetics is not different than just looking around you. So you all, everybody knows people that want all the latest catches or love cars. I, 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 I would never spend a euro on a car. I love a car just uh, for practical reasons, but it could be a tiny one that looks ugly. So I don't need money for a car, but I like to travel, for example. So I need money for traveling. But someone else said, well, I, I don't want to travel at all. So it's a very personal experience where you use money for and what you need. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Butler.